right, guys, welcome to our third and final session here today. I'm joined by Professor Kate Pickett and Professor Richard Wilkinson, who are going to get, present on culture and mental health. So Kate is Professor of Epidemiology in the Department of Health Sciences at the University of York and leads the Public Health and Society Research Group. Along with Richard, she's the co-author of The Spirit Level and The Inner Level, and her work addresses the social determinants of health and well-being. She was a National Institute for, for a Health Research Career Scientist from 2007 to 2012, is a Fellow of the RSA and a Fellow of the UK Faculty of Public Health. Richard Wilkinson is a Brit British social epidemiologist, author, advocate and political activist. He is Professor Emeritus of Social Epidemiology at the University of Nottingham, having retired in 2008. He is also an Honorary Professor of Epidemiology and Public Health at University College London, and a visiting professor at the University of York. In 2009, Richard co-founded the Equality Trust and was awarded the Charles Colley Memorial Medal in 2014 by the Irish Cancer Society. So this is the first time we've ever had two presenters during one session at the Weekend University, so I'm really excited to give this a try and I'll just leave it to you guys now and um, um, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Kate's going to start. Thank you all for joining us today, and I hope having two of us presenting will actually make it more enjoyable um, and, and uh, less likely to send you to sleep at this time of day than if there was just one of us. Um, Rich and I are both epidemiologists, if you just heard, and I think a year ago, if you'd asked people what an epidemiologist is or what they do, most people would not have had much idea, and of course that's all changed. A year ago, people wouldn't have known what a pandemic was, but, but now they speak the language of epidemiology quite often. We, however, are not the kind of epidemiologists that have been in the news um, since the coronavirus crisis um, took off. We're not infectious disease epidemiologists or modelers, and those are the people that have been advising on how to handle the epidemiology of the, of the pandemic. We're social epidemiologists. And what that means is we study the social determinants of health and of health inequalities, try to understand the social causes of why some groups of people are healthier or less healthy than other groups of people. So we're looking at populations, the health in, of populations. And our work for the past decade, our work together, has focused on the impact of inequality, um, the gap in incomes in society, how big a gap there is between rich and poor and the effect that that has on health. Um, we started working together, what, back in 2000 and middle 2000s. And at one point we decided to write a book together because we felt we were sitting on a large body of evidence about the impact of inequality on health and social problems that wasn't widely known about. Um, and nobody, of course, reads academic papers. Um, my mum doesn't read my academic papers. I doubt if my students read my academic papers, and certainly my colleagues don't read my academic papers. I sometimes do. <laughs> Richard sometimes does. But we thought, we thought we'd write a book together to try and get these ideas out into the public because we felt they were important. We kept hearing people discussing issues like um, violent crime rates or teenage pregnancy rates without an awareness that inequality might be an underlying cause of those things. So we wrote a book called The Spirit Level, which was published in 2009, subtitled Why Equality is Better for Everyone. And that really um, looks at the impact of inequality on a broad range of health and social problems. It was unexpectedly popular, um, and we spent much of the next decade uh, disseminating that information around the world but also spent the next decade developing our thinking about the pathways that lie between income inequality and different health and social problems. And in 2018, we published a second book called The Inner Level, which is subtitled How More Equal Societies Reduce Stress, Restore Sanity and Improve Everybody's Wellbeing. Very much focused on mental health and well-being and very much focused on trying to explore the pathways from inequality to psychological states um, within individuals and within populations. 
Yes, in a, in a sense, um, one of the central things we wanted to do is get uh, people to have a more sophisticated view of uh, the effects of inequality. And I think nearly everyone has, as this slide says, a naive view that inequality only matters if it creates terrible poverty or people think it's terribly unfair. Um, but actually, we think that it has much more fundamental psychosocial effects uh, to do with dominance and subordination, superiority and inf inferiority. Uh, in a sense, things that may involve our evolved psychology to do with dominance and subordination, ranking systems um, in animals. Um, but it affects how we treat each other, how we feel about ourselves, because, you know, it, it, it raises issues to do with self-worth. If some people are regarded as hugely important and other people look down on as if they were trash, um, you know, that makes us all more worried about uh, our own self-worth. And I think that's a clue to some of the links we'll show uh, as we go along uh, with mental health. So as epidemiologists, what we do is work with statistics. We collect data or we borrow other people's data more often on um, levels of health or other kinds of problems in populations. And then we statistically link those with things we're interested in as causes. Now, Richard said um, that we're trying to get over a naive view um, of income inequality and its, its effects and move on to a more... Trying to overcome, not over... <laughs> <laughs> um, trying to overcome <laughs> a more naive view and move to a more sophisticated view. But one thing that we realised quite early on when we are thinking about how we disseminate the kind of work we do is that a lot of people don't like statistics and they, they don't like numbers and they don't like equations. Um, we were told that any equation you include in a book will lose you 10,000 readers. So we did make an effort to always present our research in, in quite simple and straightforward ways. But when we finally came across this graph on the internet, we realized that actually we hadn't gone far enough. And this simple Graphical representation actually represents all of our work over the last, what, at least two decades well, I think together. It represents 40 years of my work. Uh, I was delighted when I found it on Google Images. It's a great asset when you're giving lectures and want slides. So we are going to show you quite a few graphs. They're slightly more complicated than this, but not a lot. And um, basically, if you can understand this one, you can understand everything that we're going to show you. So here's a slightly more complicated graph, but very much showing the same, following the same pattern. And what we're looking at here is an index of health and social problems in different countries. These are the rich, developed market democracies. And we took data from reliable and robust sources on measures of health for each country. That includes life expectancy, infant mortality, um, obesity and mental illness. And in these data, that measure of mental illness includes drug and alcohol addiction. The index also includes things that you might think of as children's life chances, um, educational scores in maths and literacy for 15 year olds, um, teenage birth rates, social mobility. And then third type of measure are things to do with relationships between people in society. So the level of trust, the homicide rate, levels of imprisonment. And putting all of those things together into a single score for each country, we then looked at that in relation to a country's level of income inequality. So if you're looking at this graph, Along the bottom, we have income inequality. So the countries that are to the left of the graph are more equal, like Japan, Norway, Sweden and Finland. And countries towards the right hand side, the UK, Portugal and USA are more unequal. Countries at the top have worse health and social problems and countries at the bottom are doing better. And there's a very strong correlation between a country's performance on the index of health and social problems and its level of income inequality. 
with Japan and the Scandinavian countries being more equal and having a lower level of problems, UK, Portugal and the USA doing much worse in terms of both inequality and level of health and social problems. We should point out that this is the data we used when we were writing uh, the spirit level um, and countries have changed quite a bit since then. Japan, for instance, is less equal than it was then. Now, thinking about inequality and health and other problems is um, a contentious and, and political thing to do. Um, we knew that some people might look at this graph and think that we've just chosen the problems you know, to suit ourselves. So we repeated the whole exercise with somebody else's index of well-being. And we chose the UNICEF index of child well-being. This was first published in 2007. And at that time, the UK actually came bottom. So some people in the audience might remember that as it, as it caused quite, quite a lot of attention in, in our media at that time. This chart is um, from the UNICEF index of child well-being that was published in 2013, um, by which time we were doing a little bit better and the USA comes bottom on this one. Again, we're relating it here to a measure of income inequality, low inequality countries still on the left and high inequality countries on the right. But on this index, if you're near the top, you're doing better. And if you're near the bottom, you're doing worse. And the UNICEF index of child wellbeing contains usually about 40 components across several domains, everything from whether or not children get along with their parents, um, to whether they have vaccinations, to um, educational attainment, lots of different things. So Norway, Netherlands, Scandinavian countries, again, doing well, low levels of inequality, high levels of child well-being, USA, Portugal, doing less well once again. We also, although we're not going to show you, repeated the whole exercise a third time, looking at inequality in the different American states in relation to our index of health and social problems and found exactly the same thing. So these look to be consistent relationships. Um, and what we're going to do now is just show you a few of those individual factors in those indexes in relation to inequality to show you the scale of, of the problem. Right, this one's looking at imprisonment. Now, rates of imprisonment are higher in more unequal countries. And here again, we've got the more equal countries on the left and the more unequal countries on the right. And we're looking at the number of prisoners per 100,000 people in the population. At the more equal end of the spectrum, Japan, the Nordic countries again, there are around 50 people in prison per 100,000 but it's much, much higher in the more unequal countries. And in fact, these data are presented on a log scale. So up the side there on the left, the distance between 10 and 100 is the same as the distance between 100 and 1,000. And we're showing these data on a log scale because otherwise we couldn't fit them on the screen. Um, Singapore has close to sort of 400 people in prison per 100,000 rather than 50. And in the USA, it's over 600. And this isn't to do with different, um, this isn't strongly correlated with crime rates in those different countries. Um, only about a third of this pattern can be explained by differing crime rates. What we're seeing here are, is how harsh a judicial system different nations have, how likely they are to send people to prison if they come into the criminal justice system, how long the sentences are. Um, how much recidivism there is, how much people return to prison after committing a crime and then being released. In this next one, we're looking at bullying. Um, and these data come from a Canadian colleague of ours looking at 37 different countries and finding, again, a statistically significant correlation between income inequality and the proportion of children who say they have been bullied, uh, who have bullied others two or more times per month. We really wish we had a measure 
of um, adult bullying in different societies, but we don't. But we have this measure of bullying in schools um, from the World Health Organization and much higher rates of bullying in countries with bigger income differences. So about one fifth of children bullying others in the more unequal countries um, and less than one in 20 in the more equal ones. This next slide looks at social mobility. Now, across the political spectrum, most people would agree that young people should have equal opportunities. But what this graph shows is that you don't have equal opportunities where you don't have equality of outcomes. So social mobility is a measure of how likely it is that children can transcend their social class of origin, move up and down in society, irrespective of who their parents are. And that's much more likely in the more equal countries. Um, Denmark, Norway, Finland, Canada, Sweden, high levels of social mobility, much lower in the United States and the United Kingdom, but even lower in the Latin American countries that have been included here. Um, we often say when showing this slide that if you want to live the American dream, you'd better go and live in Denmark because that's where it's most possible. And one last slide before I hand over um, to Richard. This slide shows a measure of what would we call it, creativity, In innovation. Yeah. Um, some people have said in the past that inequality doesn't really matter um, because perhaps we need some inequality to drive people's ambitions and aspirations that with greater equality comes less creativity and innovation. This graph um, from a colleague we met in, in South Korea who works primarily in Cambridge and in Japan, looked at patents granted per head of population as a measure of innovation for different countries. And again, found a significant relationship with inequality. You get more creativity, more innovation in the more equal countries. And we think that's probably due to the impact of inequality on educational attainment for children, how likely they are to um, stay in education or drop out of high school, how much their talent is, is, is fostered rather than wasted. So income inequality is reducing the creativity and innovation of the population, reducing people's chances to transcend their social class of origin. It's as if it's, it's restricting the capabilities and, and flattening the trajectories of whole swathes of the population. Yeah, it probably involves uh, that social mobility graph Kate showed you and even the imprisonment one, perhaps the mental illness we're going on to. But I think it's an important graph for economists to see because I think they would expect the relationship to be the other way around. I want now to get to what I think is, in a way, is at the heart of the effects of, of inequality. Uh, a number of the graphs Kate has shown you shows that it, inequality is affecting human behavior, whether it's on how punitive sentences are or, or levels of homicide uh, or, or things like this uh, creativity, uh, patents. Um, so, in a way, they're telling us that somehow inequality is affecting what goes on in our heads, what we think and feel. Um, and I think at the heart of that is how inequality affects social relations in different societies. So, if we go to this next slide, uh, there are now quite a number of, of academic research papers showing that um, people are less involved in community life in more unequal societies, that less likely to belong to civic associations, community groups, voluntary groups, things like that, probably less likely to, to know their neighbours. Um, you can also see going with that is uh, they trust each other less. Again, a number of analyses of, of these relationships showing that uh, in more unequal countries, quite uh, uh, big differences in, in trust that down here um, on the right um, in more unequal countries, only 15 or 20 percent of the population would agree that most people can be trusted. 
whereas in the more equal countries on the left, it rises to, what, 60, 65 uh, percent. So really big differences in this really important indication of the quality of social relations and whether people trust each other or not is absolutely fundamental. Um, there are also papers which show that people are less willing to help each other in more unequal societies, less willing to help the disabled or the elderly, for instance. Uh, so the, the sort of community reciprocity seems to break down. Uh, and that's really important, too. Um, but there are also other um, important uh, patterns. This uh, is an analysis that's come out in the last few months based on a psychological experiment where um, they look at how often wallets, they do some experiment where wallets are, are left around and uh, how many are handed in. Um, and... Uh, uh, the rate of return of wallets, how often you get your lost wallet back, uh, is much higher in the more equal countries on the left. So more honesty, if you like, uh, and good reasons why people are more likely to trust each other in more equal countries. You see, 80% of the wallets come back in the more equal countries, whereas perhaps only 20% in the more unequal ones. I lost my wallet three times when I lived in America. Mm -hmm. So I probably account for most of that. Did, it, did you ever <laughs> got, get it back? I got it back all, all three times. Oh, did you? Yeah. Well, you were lucky. I was. <laughs> um, so uh, it's not only these measures of, of community um, involvement and trust and so on, but also uh, relationships with violence. This is one of the earliest relationships that uh, people showed with inequality, homicide rates, um, they're easy to compare internationally. Homicide is defined in similar ways. Um, and there are many analyses which show that homicide rates are much higher in more unequal countries. The differences, as in the graphs Kate showed you, are really large. Uh, the red dots are American states. Uh, the blue triangles are Canadian provinces. And you see uh, the more equal um, provinces on the left, it's about 15 homicides per million people, but it goes up to 150 or so. Um, and actually, people always imagine that this is about uh, gun control. Uh, it's not. Um, when we controlled for uh, gun ownership, we found the relationship is with inequality is slightly less clear. Um, it slightly masks the relationship. Uh, it it's, it's really is a relationship with inequality and, as I say, very well established around the world. Um, however, if you go to much more unequal countries than the ones we've been looking at in this, this data, if you go to places like Mexico, um, where we gave a few lectures uh, some years ago, uh, I took this picture and it's fairly typical of street after street. You see... Uh, houses barricaded like this, these great fences with spikes on top and razor wire, windows barred and doors similarly, uh, house after house like that. Similarly, um, South Africa, which again is extremely unequal, much more unequal than the US or Britain, um, uh, and the same thing. It seems to me those countries have moved a step further. Uh, they've not only lost that reciprocity and trust, but people are actually frightened of each other, uh, where those inequalities are simply huge. This notice, I'm sorry, the focus isn't better, says armed response, that uh, if you're caught climbing in, you might get shot. Those wires over the top are an electric fence. And big dogs yeah, in the don't, background. Don't forget the big dogs in so the background. So if you don't get shot, you'll get eaten by one of those enormous animals. Um, but I, I mean, it's it's an absolutely huge loss uh, uh, of our sociability, which is so fundamental to hum human well-being and happiness and so on. Um, what I think is is really extraordinary is that that picture I've given you over the last few slides 
um, is the interpretation fits exactly uh, what has been shown uh, from a quite different angle. Uh, this is from two American economists, Bowles and Jayadev, and they look at the proportion of the labor force in each country uh, involved in what they call guard labor. Um, by guard labor, they mean uh, the proportion of the population who are police, uh, security staff, prison officers, people like that, um, basically the people we use to protect ourselves from each other. And as inequality increases, a higher proportion of the labor force are involved in protecting us from each other. And I imagine also if we had figures of the number of solicitors, you know, where you don't trust other people, you resort to law more often. So these are real, real expensive effects of inequality, um, protecting ourselves from each other. Uh, and and tell us something very fundamental about the effects of inequality. I don't think we should think of this as different from class and status. Uh, it's not that income inequality is, is quite different from what we've always known about the social gradients in all sorts of problems. I mean, we've always known that health is worst in the poorest areas. Usually violence is, is higher in those poor areas. Uh, kids' school performance is poorer in those areas. So many of these problems, almost all the ones that we've shown, have those social gradients, although they exist at the top of society. Uh, so there is mental illness, drug abuse, violence, and so on at the top of society. They're all more common at the bottom. It is those problems that get worse with more inequality. Um, and in a, in a way, that seems so obvious. I mean, the problems we know are related to uh, um, social status get worse when we increase the social status differentials. Um, and as soon as you say that, it sounds so obvious. We should always have recognized this. Um, I think uh, the fact that we haven't is, is it really needs explaining that it's, it's such an obvious point. But there is one real surprising element in this, and that is it's not just the poor who are affected by inequality. It's not just things amongst the poor that get worse with more inequality. The biggest effects uh, are amongst the poor, but even well-off middle-class people, well-educated, good incomes and so on, good jobs like ourselves, uh, we would probably live more a little bit longer in a more equal society. Our children might do a little bit better at school. Uh, they'd be less likely to become seriously involved with uh, drugs and so on, and less likely to become teenage parents. In that sense, almost the whole society seems to do better in a more equal society. Okay, we're going to move on to think about mental illness and, and psychological health now. And our starting point for this um, was our understanding of the link between mental illness and income inequality across different countries. Um, we were the first to show this correlation. It's now been confirmed and replicated by many different um, researchers across the world looking at, looking at different conditions. But this, this was the first graph that, that we ever had um, on this issue. And it was using data from large population-based random surveys in different countries, asking people questions about mental health symptoms. So this isn't a measure of whether or not a doctor has told you you have a mental illness or whether or not you've been diagnosed or treated with one. Or even your recognition of mental illness, mm. it's not affected by that. It's using diagnostic interviews that ask you about symptoms that can then be clustered into different mental health categories. Um, and from that, we get the percentage of people with any mental illness in the past year. And these data show that in the more equal countries, it's fewer than one in 10 in the population have some kind of mental illness in the past year. It's 23% for the UK and Australia. Um, and more than one in four in the USA. And when we first published this in the British Journal of Psychiatry, somebody wrote in and said, did we really believe that this proportion of the population had some kind of mental illness? 
or were we buying into the pathologization of um, anxieties, situational depression, sort of normal responses to what society is like? But that's sort of missing the point because our point isn't really whether or not 23% is exactly correct measure for the UK. It's why, when you measure things in the same way, there are such big differences between different countries and trying to explain that. Well, it's certainly a reflection of differences in emotional well-being in the population. Um, and although the, the slide Kate has just shown you was one of the earliest uh, we produced, uh, this is from a recent publication in, in the British Medical Journal looking at a greater, larger number of countries, OECD countries, um, and looking at a, a bigger and different range of mental illnesses. Uh, those long bars to the right uh, show higher rates of, of mental illness um, in uh, more unequal countries. Um, the correlation coefficient between uh, the rates of mental illness and inequality along the bottom. Um, suicide and alcoholism apparently uh, slightly uh, the other way around, slightly, but not uh, much more common in more uh, equal countries. So basically, we've got to explain what Kate showed you in the last graph and what these long bars going out to the right show here. The other thing that I think we're trying to explain is why when we live, or certainly in recent times, have lived in societies with growing levels of material affluence, you know, an improving standard of life, um, why it is that we don't actually all look like this group of people, you know, happy, shiny, um, connected, but instead look more like this group of people, um, miserable, anxious, unconnected to one another. Um, interestingly, this group of people are just in an ad for a California therapy clinic. This group of people are in the real world. They're young people on their way to, to work. This was taken at Oxford Tube Station, obviously prior to lockdown. And the, the smiley one is posed and this one is unposed. So we're really sort of trying to understand why life doesn't look and feel like this, but instead looks and feels more like this, when actually, you know, most of us have it. Not all of us, but most of us have enough to eat, have work, have shelter. Um, we are clothed. We have leisure time. Um, why is it that we have epidemic levels of mental distress, however you measure it, in, in our modern, developed, democratic societies? And the problem really is of epidemic proportions. Um, these are data from the Mental Health Foundation for the UK, from 2018, um, they found that 74%, so three quarters of adults and an even higher number of young adults were so stressed that they had felt overwhelmed or unable to cope sometime in the past year. About a third of adults and more than a third of young people had suicidal feelings as a result of stress. Um, and 16% of adults and almost a third of young adults had self-harmed as a result of stress. And we've seen similar survey data for other very unequal countries like the US. Now, when we first started thinking about this, we were reliant on work from psychologists that had been done in experimental settings to help us sort of try and understand what was going on. And I think one of the um, pieces of evidence that we found most informative was a review of studies by two psychologists from California, Dickerson and Kemeny. And what they did was look across all of the studies that psychologists had done over decades of what most stresses human beings. So I know we have a lot of psychologists on this call. Um, sometimes you guys do, do, do quite challenging things to people, bring them into a lab setting, give them something difficult to do, measure their cortisol levels in response or other hormone levels to try and find out what it is that that sparks um, stress 
in people. And what Dickerson and Kemeny found, looking across, I also have to ask Richard how many studies. I think it was 208 studies they, they reviewed in a, in a meta-analysis. See, I'm absolutely convinced it's 172, but you're probably right. Um, a lot. A lot of studies. Of, the, of this nature. So people have been brought into a lab, they've been asked to do things like speak in public, um, talk about an unpleasant experience, take a maths test and read out their scores to people. Um, and reviewing all of this evidence, Dickerson and Kameny found that it was tasks with what they call social evaluative threat that most reliably invoked a stress response. So these are tests where other people have an opportunity to judge your performance. So, for example, doing a maths test isn't particularly stressful, but doing the test and then reading out your scores to other people is. Yeah, they say in the paper it's threats to self-esteem or social status that really get to us and push up our cortisol levels. So there were a number of studies like this, also studies that look at stereotype threat, um, how it is that people's um, performance declines when other people know their social status, so they feel more judged. Um, various other experimental kinds of studies that, that led us to think that the key to the link between income inequality and mental illness was anxiety about status was how you're seen and judged by other people. And so we theorised that in more unequal societies, that threat, um, that social evaluative threat would be heightened. People would be more worried about their status because status would matter more. But we didn't at the time have any ep epidemiological evidence to suggest that that was so. Actually, no evidence comparing countries. That's right. But now we do, since 2014. Um, so here are data from a study by Leight and Whelan, colleagues from Ireland. They looked at levels of status anxiety, which are up the side here. So um, higher levels is more status anxiety. And they looked across the income distribution within countries. So they're comparing the poorest people to the richest people across society. They're looking at incomes across society in three groups of countries. So the bottom bar are European countries with low inequality. The middle bar are European countries with medium inequality. And the top bar are European countries with high levels of inequality. And you can see two patterns here. One is that within all societies, poorer people have more status anxiety, as we would expect. But unexpectedly, I think to a lot of people, across the board from poorest to richest, people in high inequality societies have more status anxiety. Status anxiety, as far as I remember, was measured by people saying they felt looked down on because of their jobs or income or education, that kind of thing. Um, that actually fits in rather uh, nicely with a recent, uh, well, it's now not so recent, uh, 2012, um, uh, analysis of uh, a huge range of papers on mental illness and personality disorders uh, by Sherry Johnson uh, and colleagues. They were looking at um, evidence, uh, behavioral, um, experimental, and biological evidence uh, that these uh, mental health conditions were uh, in, involved in the dominance behavioral system, by which they mean part of our brains uh, that I think animals in dominance hierarchies have uh, for dealing with issues to do with social status. Uh, the ability to recognize higher and lower status animals to assess your status in relation to others. Um, and uh, a, a recognition that you need, need to behave very differently uh, towards dominance. I think of monkeys in a dominance hierarchy. Uh, they have to keep out of the way of the uh, much stronger animals above them, um, whereas they tend uh, to kick around uh, uh, lower status animals. 
Um, they take the food before the lower status animals get it and so on. And so the dominance behavioral system is apparently part of our brains that is still uh, deals with these issues to do with dominance and subordination. And they found uh, a wide range of evidence uh, that the, this system was involved in, in a number of conditions, um, uh, exacerbating them uh, or triggering them. And these findings uh, I've written there, those two black um, print paragraphs, uh, they're conclusions that uh, anxiety and aggression related to subordination, to submissiveness, to the desire to avoid subordination, um, and disruptive uh, behavior disorders, mania, narcissistic traits, as we shall show you, are related to inflated self-perceptions of power, uh, heightened focus on achieving social dominance and recognition. So we could go from the graphs that Kate has uh, shown you about increased status anxiety, about our susceptibility to worries, uh, self-esteem and um, other people's judgments of us into this uh, work uh, from Sherry Johnson and colleagues. Right, I'm going to skip one and then come back to it. So what Sherry Johnson and her colleagues' work gives us then is, is um, insight, as Richard says, into the different ways in which people respond to greater inequality and threats to social status. Um, and as they point out, there are reactions of both subordination and dominance to situations where social status is important or threatened. But what they didn't realise is that both of those kinds of responses would be heightened in more unequal societies. So we get more people feeling those feelings of subordination, that they are not good enough in other people's eyes, not pretty enough, not smart enough, not funny enough. But also we get some people sort of attempting to dominate, feeling that, you know, that they need to put on a good front, that they need to sort of self-enhance and self-promote, um, sometimes to the point where they fool even themselves and, and have those beliefs deeply ingrained. We used this um, cartoon quite widely um, <laughs> before a certain um, president of the United States was elected, but it's, it's become more apposite ever, ever since. So we find more depression in more unequal societies. These are data for US states. So that, that's, that's related to greater feelings of subordination in more unequal societies. But we also find more self-enhancement, and I'm gonna go back here, more self-enhancement in more unequal societies. So self-enhancement is, is believing or at least stating that you're better than other people. So it's thinking that you're better looking than average, more intelligent than average, um, a nicer person, more capable, more competent. And we find the tendency to self-enhancement increases in more unequal societies. So you could say in a way that your worries about how you're seen and judged um, in more unequal societies lead to those two responses. You either feel inferior, low self-esteem, you get depressed and so on, you withdraw from social life, or you do rather the opposite. You go in to big yourself up, um, self-advertisement and so on. And I think once you've seen this relationship between inequality and self-enhancement, it's not surprising to see here narcissism rising as income inequality rises over time. This is data for US college students and indeed even levels of schizophrenia more common in more unequal societies. So those two differing reactions of people to living in more unequal hierarchical societies where social status matters more um, fits the neuropsychological and behavioral data coming from Sherry Johnson and all of the psychological experiments that we've been looking at previously. But of course, some people react in other ways um, rather than becoming depressed necessarily or anxious or becoming um, self-enhancing or becoming narcissistic or self-promoting. 
Some people turn to um, other ways to comfort themselves in those situations. So we see more um, drug use in more unequal societies. We see more alcoholic liver disease. We have seen recently more problem gambling in more unequal countries as well. Um, I think that uh, it's important to recognize how fundamental uh, the causal pathways we're suggesting are. A recent paper showed that uh, in uh, the well-being of animals, um, in, in the health and longevity, uh, social integration, social status, and early life adversity are important. Those are the things that uh, researchers working on health inequalities, the social determinants of health, have really come up with as the key determinants uh, of health and well-being amongst human beings. But also now we know that a number of different animal species, as shown there, um, have basically the same pattern uh, across species. What really matters is how you get on with other members of your own species, your social status in relation to them, and uh, your early life uh, nurturing and uh, experience of adversity. I want just to cover... Uh, say a few words about uh, what I think is a very fundamental problem uh, touching on inequality and giving rise to some of these patterns in human beings. Um, in uh, our understanding of, our growing understanding of the determinants of health, it's become clear that in a way social status and friendship uh, are, are a sort of Jekyll and Hyde of public health. Social, bigger social status differences or low social status are very damaging to health. Um, but friendship is highly protective. Um, lots of studies showing that um, whether you have friends, the quality of your relationships, whether you're involved in community life, it's, it's as important as whether or not you smoke to your survival over a follow-up period. Um, but these are, in a sense, the two opposite ways in which human beings can come together. Either uh, the rich and powerful, the dominants, uh, get everything first, the pickings of um, uh, the best food, uh, so on. Um, or you get the pattern with friendship where there's a recognition of each other's needs um, and a willingness to share and cooperate. Um, and I think it's interesting that in a number of uh, European languages, probably many others, uh, a word like companion has this idea in it of your friends are the people with whom you share the basic necessities, with whom you share your bread. Um, and uh, um, I think the statement from this wonderful American anthropologist who studied uh, the very equal uh, egalitarian societies of hunters and gatherers, um, uh, which reflect, I suppose, 90% of our existence as anatomically modern human beings. He made this statement, gifts make friends and friends make gifts. These societies were based on uh, gift exchange and food sharing. Skip Get that one? Yeah. Okay. Right, we've got about 10 minutes left to address what can be done about all of these problems. So this will be a bit of a whistle-stop tour through some of our thinking about potential solutions, and then we'll look forward to picking up this with you more in, in the question and answer session after our break. So if we think about what can be done to address income inequality, there's really two main strategies one is to try and address income differences before tax. So make income differences smaller in what people are actually paid. And the other is to use our taxes and benefits system to redistribute incomes that might be quite unequal to start with. But, but we use our social security and our taxation systems to even things out. If we're going to try and reduce income differences before tax. We think that stronger trade unions are important. We think increasing economic democracy is important. 
and, and we'll touch on that in, in a few minutes. If we're going to go at things through taxes and benefits, then we need to stop tax avoidance and tax havens and make taxation progressive again. We actually believe we need both of these strategies. Um, doing everything through taxes and benefits is appealing and can be quick, but can be rapidly overturned if you get a change of government. Trying to reduce income differences before tax probably involves processes and, and changes that might mean greater equality gets more deeply embedded in society. But we would argue that we need both. And the problem facing us in the UK is that we have very high levels of income inequality since the early 1980s, um, under Thatcher, we saw a massive rise in income inequality from 1979 onwards that has never been undone by successive Labour governments through, through the 90s um, and certainly not since austerity in 2010. But the problem we're dealing with is really that massive rise that took place in the early 80s and our failure to address that Which ever since. in a sense has made us a more antisocial society in many ways, um, long-term consequences of it. One of the things that has contributed to, to that is changes in tax levels. Um, interesting uh, that uh, this suggestion that um, uh, top tax rates should go up to 75% um, is uh, far from what top tax rates have been in the early years after, during the war and after the war in the 60s and through the 70s, top tax rates, both in Britain and America, were much, much higher. And we were as egalitarian as the Scandinavian countries are now. Countries really change their positions fundamentally. Um, and uh, that rise in inequality um, was to a substantial extent caused by the kind of economic thinking that came in with Reagan and Thatcher, uh, the free market fundamentalism, if you like. But one of the things you can see very clearly is the runaway incomes at the top. This is uh, American data, but we think it's uh, very similar to what's happened in, in Britain and other countries. It's The graph is showing the ratio of CEOs pay right at the top of companies uh, to the average production worker in the same companies. And you see dates along the bottom um, in 1975 or 1980, uh, the CEOs were getting 20 or 30, maybe 40 times as much as uh, the average production worker. But by 2000, the first decade this century, they were getting two, three, or 400 times as much. Uh, that huge explosion of differentials within companies, which we know is bad for companies. And of course, that's always defended by people saying, well, you have to pay people at the top if you want talent and, and innovation. You know, if you want the best, you have to pay the most. Um, but this chart shows that that's not true. The red line shows um, the performance of some very large companies in America over time in returning um, profit to their shareholders. And the red line is for companies where the chief executive was paid more than average, and the gray line is for companies where the chief executive was paid less than average. So the companies that paid their chief executives more saw lower returns to their shareholders. So the argument that, you know, you need to pay for that top talent doesn't really bear scrutiny. Over, over the long term, uh, I mean, the whole of the 20th century shown here, uh, you see this sort of U-shaped relationship between income inequality uh, uh, in in number of different countries. So from the 1920s, uh, sometime in the 1930s, income inequality starts to decline. Uh, it goes on declining until the late 1970s, and then you get the modern rise of, of inequality. I think that is, uh, if you like, the strengthening and then the weakening of uh, the, the social democratic movement, uh, the uh, 
uh, strength of unionized labor force, um, the fear of communism, uh, the idea that there can, is another way of doing things, which is better for all of us. And to back that up, this graph shows uh, the top red line uh, through the 20th century is the share of income uh, going to the top 10% in the USA. So again, that U-shaped pattern. But if you look at the proportion of the population in trade unions, you see exactly the opposite. It looks almost like a mirror image. I don't think this is just because unions do wonderful things for their members. I think it's a marker of the strength of the whole labor movement, the social democratic movement. But as it uh, first strengthened and then weakening, uh, you get that rise and fall of, uh, of e equality. Um, when we talk about economic democracy, uh, a lot of European countries have legislation for employee representatives on company boards. It's weak in many countries, but it's strong in a few countries like Germany. Um, uh, we think we need much more than just token representation. Uh, hopefully, uh, a proportion of employees on boards would increase over time. But the research, the evaluations of more democratic model company models suggest that uh, uh, it not only reduces pay ratios within companies, you know, you're not going to say your boss should have uh, 300 times as much as you, um, but it transforms the experience of work. Um, it seems to improve productivity as well. Uh, uh, and in a way, the, the graph Kate showed you, that the companies with the best paid CEOs actually do less well uh, is also reflected in the evaluations of these companies. Um, but we uh, think as a, 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 and the evidence is patchy, but as far as it goes, it seems to suggest that uh, more, e more egalitarian and more democratic companies are more in, 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 sorry, <laughs> environmentally responsible. We do think that inequality is a central issue for transforming our societies to be more sustainable. Um, and probably this is the key reason, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and in a way, the big obstacle to uh, moving towards sustainability is consumerism. Um, and it's now very clear, not only for the studies we mentioned here, but many others, that uh, the increase of inequality increases status competition. Uh, rather like the self-enhancement graph Kate showed you earlier, um, we big ourselves up partly by uh, through the goods we we consume right? by buying a car that looks looks good, by buying clothes with the right labels and so on. So it's 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 not a basic human acquisitiveness that drives consumerism. It's our worries about how we appear to each other. And of course, advertisers exploit that. We've shown that advertising spend per capita is higher in more unequal societies. Um, Richard likes to use this image um, as a representative of that. I prefer one that shows you can buy um, a Louis Vuitton rubbish bag to put your rubbish in. But but they, they're, they're getting to the same I, point. I show this as one of the nastiest ads I know. I'm playing on that idea people feel worthless. And of course, that's uh, increased by inequality, making some people seem so important and others so worthless. Um, this shows uh, the scale of the, the way in which inequality feeds into consumerism. People actually borrow more um, as inequality goes up to try and keep up with the, each other's consumption. Um, it's, it's a really powerful effect. So this is our last slide before the break. Um, and we wanted to share with you, some of you may, may know this model, but others of you may not. Kate Raworth's um, model, which she calls the donut model. And the reason we like this model is, is that it's defining a safe and just space for humanity. That's, that's the green band. That's a space in which we can all live um, within inclusive and sustainable economies that are supported by strong social foundations. And that's all the things in the middle, 
health, food, water, income, education, resilience, etc. But also that we're living within our planetary boundaries, and those are the things on the outside. So that our safe and just space for us as humans means creating um, a space that is within planetary boundaries and supported by everything that all of us need. And we, we like this as a model because I think it forces us to see the interconnectedness of everything. However, I think we might put social equity, which she has as, as just one of those um, factors within the social foundation in the middle, we might put that right at the centre. Because unless you address income inequality and hierarchies and class inequalities within society, unless you try and create a more democratic, egalitarian, sharing, caring community, then everybody's access to all of those other things within the social foundations is going to be compromised and everybody's well-being will be compromised too. Can I say one more thing? In a sense, all we've talked about, I think, are things to do with sense of self-worth and whether people feel valued. So think of that related to inequality. Right. We'll stop there and take a break and look forward to having questions and answers with you afterwards. So the first question is from Roy, and he's asked, what are your thoughts on universal basic income? Well, um, we're not experts on universal basic income, but I think we're both uh, uh, feel we're rather in favor of it from the little we do know. Um, Kate was actually planning to do a trial of it in uh, uh, a big community study she's involved in in Bradford. But um, it, it seems to me that it becomes really important if all these predictions of how automation, um, information technology and so on is going to destroy such a large proportion of our jobs. You know, if we really face a situation where there's huge unemployment uh, and a small elite who own all the automation machines and so on, then you need some form of universal basic income. But I think it depends very much on how it's paid for, whether it's as well as benefits or instead of them. Um, these sorts of issues are crucial. For sure. Okay, so the next one is from Ignacio, and he's asked, to control for culture, have you examples of countries that have significantly changed inequality and how has that changed the variables of interest presented? I think the best example historically um, is the shifting relationship um, between income inequality and outcomes that we see in the United States and in Japan. So if we were showing you graphs relating income inequality to health just after the Second World War, Japan would have been the most equal, unequal of those countries and would have had poor health in comparison to, to other countries we've shown you today. Whereas the USA used to be a lot more equal than it is and it used to do better in the international rankings of, of health. And they have changed places completely over the course of the last half of the 20th century so that Japan ended up where the USA used to be and the USA ended up where Japan used to be. And the irony is, is that Japan's greater equality following the Second World War was to a great extent imposed upon it by the United States, um, but they, they benefited from, from those changes. I think another uh, aspect of this is, in a way, the question reflects uh, an assumption, I think, that culture is separate from um, inequality. We think of inequality as a powerful determinant of culture. So, for instance, there are now studies that show that uh, populism has arisen particularly in the most unequal countries. Um, uh, and we can see how that's changed the way people think and relate to each other. Uh, trust in uh, institutions has uh, disappeared. Um, but if I just take an example of uh, very unequal countries, which are very unequal for totally different reasons, take Mexico uh, and South Africa and Russia, you know, the history and background explanations of why they are now so unequal 
totally different. So culture uh, really contrasting. And yet, because of their inequality, they all have very high rates of violence, appalling rates of violence. Okay, very interesting. So the next one is from Olivia. And she's, she said that she's curious about Japan on one, on one of the graphs that you've shown. It's notorious for honor culture, which may result in mental illness being underreported, especially in men, as it can be seen as a sign of weakness. How was this considered in correlating the graph? And then Lynn has also had a follow up to that. She's asked, how were people selected for the sample in Japan? Maybe people who felt they had mental illnesses in Japan chose not to fill it in. Well, the data on mental illness come from um, a large international study conducted by the World, World Health Organization that was really trying to address this issue. So for a long time, people thought that you couldn't compare levels of mental illness across different countries for the very cultural reasons that the questioners are asking about. People in different cultures might be more or less likely to report problems with their mental health in different cultures. So the World Health Organization set out to sort of try and get beyond those problems. And that's why they were asking about symptoms rather than about um, self-reported mental illness per se. So you were, would be asked if you had been suffering from sleeplessness or loss of appetite rather than being asked if you suffered from depression. Um, that doesn't mean that cultural differences are entirely taken out of the picture, but, but the effort was being made to do that. The samples are randomly selected samples of the adult population, so they're representative of, of the populations as a whole. But we think actually there is a, a sort of countervailing uh, tendency to what the questioner um, was thinking of, that uh, in more unequal countries, you have to appear resilient, tough, um, uh, independent, um, able to look after yourself, um, whereas in more equal countries, you're more likely to be able to uh, admit to, to failings and so on. Um, there's an interesting pattern. Uh, when people have looked at self-reported health, when asked, how has your health been during the last month or so? Excellent, good, fair, poor, bad. Um, and if you compare the answers uh, to a question like that, you find in more unequal countries, um, it, it runs almost inversely to what death rates show, what life expectancy shows. So more equal countries like Japan, which have in terms of life expectancy and most the best health in the world, uh, look as if their self-reported health is very bad. And I think in the United States, to admit to weakness, uh, or even in these surveys of happiness, to, for an American to admit that they're not, ha not happy is, a, is an admission of failure for a Japanese person to say, yes, I'm happy, everything is excellent in my life. Sounds like bragging. So you probably say, if you're asked whether you're happy as well, I'm doing all right, you know. Um, not too bad, um, a more modest reply. I, th I think the questioner had got it spot on, actually. I, oh. think, I think they were asking that way around. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the next one's from Kay. So you place a lot of emphasis on economic and taxation solutions. Do you think that there's also a need to work alongside this in organizations and workplaces to show how creating more compassionate workplace cultures less subordination and dominance can improve well-being and perhaps productivity? Or do you see this as neglecting more important underlying economic drivers behind these things? Well, I'd say let's have both, please. Um, you know, I think, I think the structural um, inequalities in our society of poverty and inequality are structural violence that actually does destroy well-being um, both in institutions and in the population as a whole, and those structural determinants need to be dealt with. Alongside that, yes, I think it's extremely helpful to have softer um, kinds of approaches to the problem. I think we do all need to learn to be um, caring and compassionate to one another, 
learn how to live in communities, learn what social relationships should be like. And as all of us in the UK who've grown up here, have grown up in a very unequal society, I think we might well need a fair amount of help in, in, in making progress in those areas. But I'd like to see those two things go hand in hand yeah. to create more compassionate communities and institutions. It shouldn't just depend on training and people learning to be nice to each other or having a good boss. It should be uh, that plus yeah. being part of the structure. Yeah. Okay. So the next one's from Kate Monfort. And Kate has asked, children in the care system are four times more at risk of mental health conditions and families who have lower economic status are more at risk of having their children re removed from their care due to various factors. What are your thoughts on this and have you got any ideas for solutions? We've seen um, real substantial increases in um, looked after children in the UK. And it is a huge worry because we know that their outcomes are not as good. Clearly, prevention is better than, than anything that, that we might take on as a solution. But that means working with families from from early on, preferably from before birth, with with expectant families. It means providing them with with serious levels of support and resources, and being hand in hand with them through their journeys as they as they learn to parent, so that children needing to be looked after is an absolute last resort. Um, that takes a huge amount of time and commitment and what will look like a lot of money to start with. But the savings um, long term of anything that we do preventively to keep children well and happy and successful um, will, will pay back in, in spades. So it, all, it will always be financially worthwhile doing that. It's just the payoff will take longer than the typical political cycle. So it's quite hard to get buy-in for the kinds of investment we need to actually reverse those problems. Mm. So Kate, I know in our last conversation that you mentioned that you were doing some work um, researching COVID's effect on mental, effects on mental health. Um, could you maybe tell us some about some of your key findings there? Sure. So I'm involved with um, Born in Bradford, which is a really large um, set of projects in the city of Bradford in the north of England. Um, Bradford's the fifth largest city in England, and um, it's quite a young city, a poor city, and a very ethnically diverse city. So even before COVID, we had quite high levels of um, financial insecurity, mental health problems, um, poor child health low attainment, lots of social, economic and health problems. But we have been looking at the impact of not so much um, the COVID-19 infection pandemic, but, but the government response to it of lockdown, of um, closing schools, restricting people's movements and activities. And we have seen a rise, a statistically significant rise in levels of clinical levels of mental illness among parents. We've surveyed um, over 2,000 parents so far, and we now have a prevalence of clinical levels of depression of 40% among those parents and of clinical levels of anxiety of 40% as well. Um, we've been asking children about the impact. Those data have just come in and we haven't yet analysed them, but um, we will be analyzing and publishing as we go along. But it's clear from a number of other studies as well that the impact of the pandemic on mental health is, is significant for um, children, for adults, for everybody in the community. Um, and as well as clinical kinds of conditions, we're seeing an increase in loneliness, an increase in, in people's sense of disconnection, an increase in people sort of reporting stress. And some of it quite heartbreaking, you know, parents saying, um, that they feel inadequate, unable to sort of help their children with their homeschooling while trying to maintain some employment and serious levels of financial concern. And we were asking these questions while furlough was still in place at the higher level mm. um, and seeing particular mental health difficulties 
among people where the main earner in the household had been furloughed or the main earner was self-employed. Um, because for them, their incomes had really just sort of dropped off the cliff. And if they were just managing before, which was true for a lot of our families, they were getting by, but only just, 80% of getting by is not enough. And so we're seeing more food insecurity, more worries about losing your home, um, more worries about, about money, and that takes a huge toll on mental health. I mean, it's in this study that Kate is in, heavily involved in, born in Bradford, it's a hugely important study. 13,000 children who've been followed through uh, from birth and are now aged what? They're 9 to 11 at the moment. Very interesting. Okay, so um, Lynn has asked, can you link the quality of relationships with mental health? How does this change with varying levels of equality? Quality of relationships. Um, well, what are the how, things? How is it what? How is it linked to, to this relationship between income inequality and mental health? Well, I think it, 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 I suspect that why... Uh, community life atrophies with greater inequality is that social contact becomes more fraught. Um, those status anxieties, our worries about how we're seen and judged uh, increase. Um, uh, and, and so we become less confident in social interactions. Uh, many people, for instance, have levels of social anxiety that mean they avoid uh, social gatherings, parties and so on, uh, and sometimes become uh, very isolated, some not even wanting to answer the door or the telephone. Um, and we know, nearly, we know, nearly all of us know people who are so worried uh, about uh, others' judgments of them um, that they avoid social contact. And I think those issues to do with self-worth, that slide Kate showed you, that cartoon of a girl feeling she wasn't good enough, she's not pretty enough, she's not funny enough, uh, all those kinds of anxieties. Uh, to a less extent, we all feel them, uh, but they are exacerbated by inequality uh, and our feelings that, you know, other people are so much better than us. There's some more direct things as well, aren't there? I mean, we didn't show a graph that, that we could have shown that links um, longer working hours to greater inequality. So actually, the average person working, employed in Norway, works nine weeks less per year than the average worker in the United States. And, and we're obviously we're on the bad end of that, not 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 the good end. And you know, if you're trying to have quality relationships with your family, with your friends, with your co-workers, and in your neighbourhood community, time is essential for that. And so, just the simple fact that we work longer hours, I think, is in opposition to the quality of our relationships. In unequal countries like Britain, some people have to work on Sunday afternoons. <laughs> <laughs> It's not fair. Um, so Ignacio has asked, how localised are the effects of inequality? In other words, does international inequality cause any issues? Uh, I think less so, um, but it may become more important as people become more aware of differences in, in living standards and so on. And I do think that... Um, we have concentrated on issues to do with our evolved sensitivity to uh, social hierarchy. Um, you know, we showed a slide of the, the social pyramid being either a very steep one like that with large income differences or a much shallower one. I think that's what we're talking about. Uh, and it does work through uh, our inherited sensitivity to these issues. I think they are less involved in international comparisons, but probably becoming more involved. Um, my daughter in Sierra Leone, for instance, uh, who she spent time in Sierra Leone during the Ebola uh, crisis, uh, she said she spent time in small villages and so on, 
And she said people regarded Europeans as cleverer than them because they had produced all this technology and so on. And so that uh, clear indication of a feeling of inferiority in some respects. And I think uh, um, low-skilled workers uh, in Britain often regard themselves as, as inferior um, in similar ways. Mm. Okay, so Steph Land has asked, with recent events with George Floyd, the George Floyd Black Lives Matter movement, how much do you think racial inequality contributes to the issues you've talked about? And is there any UK data on this yet? I think that uh, one needs to regard racism uh, as not a different process from what we're talking about. Um, it's, and skin color starts to matter when it becomes a marker of low social status and starts to attract the same forms of uh, prejudice, uh, stigma, and so on that, that poverty does. Um, and in other societies, uh, different things are the markers of low social status. So uh, still um, accents in Britain are important. Um, but uh, uh, in other societies, it might be what religion you, you have or what language you speak. And I think it's very important to, to realize that you can't get rid of things like racism uh, simply by deciding, I will be free of uh, prejudging people by their skin color. I will try not to do that. Because that tendency to see, to judge people by their social position is so strong. Much more fundamental approach to it is to reduce the differences in inequality. Um, so we, the, the, the forces generating those prejudices are weakened. But I mean, I would also, I think the Black Lives Matter movement and COVID-19 have revealed much more starkly than people were willing to see before um, inequalities in health and well-being and socioeconomic status for black and minority ethnic populations for people of low social class and in sort of low income jobs. Both COVID and the Black Lives Matter movement have, have kind of sharpened our focus on things that were there and should have been in plain sight all the time. Vast income inequalities, vast health inequalities, but society was looking away. Society had pulled a veil over them Society was choosing to consider those as problems of people not like us, and I, I think it's it's not as easy to do that now. For sure, for sure. Um, so, for somebody at home listening to this, um, who's really passionate and wants to actually do something about it and maybe get involved, what advice? Like, what can they practically do? Just you know, is there any organisations you would recommend to check out, or what? What would you say to someone now that wants to actually do something and get involved? Well, Kate is finishing <laughs> her period of chairing the Equality <laughs> Trust, which we both set up. So I think she should answer. Sure. Well, we helped to set up the Equality Trust in, in 2009 and it's still out there, very active. It has local groups all, all over the country that you, you can join. But also the website would, would suggest other ways to take action or get involved in, in promoting greater equality. Both Rich and I are also involved with an organisation called the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. That's a much more international grouping. Um, again, there's a website that people can go look at and you can sign up, join in, find ways to get involved. But I think I think there are more personal ways that, that people can get involved as well. And that's informing yourself about these issues, you know, learning the importance of people's sense of how they're judged by one another and then using that to inform how we treat one another and how we um, expect and demand that other people treat one another. And also at this moment, you know, we have seen an outbreak, an epidemic of community solidarity in some places, not all and not for all people. But where that has happened, you know, let's hang on to that post-COVID. Let, let's make that a long-term proposition and really learn how to keep on taking care of one another as best we can. 
I think it's really important to recognize the importance of demonstrations, um, protests in changing public opinion. The Occupy movement some years ago, the Black Lives Matter movement have really helped shift uh, opinion and get issues into the media in a way that uh, we hadn't managed to before. Brilliant. Okay, well, thank you both very much. Um, it's been a fascinating presentation. Thank you for the, the 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 work that you're doing and the contribution that you're making to this to this area. It's it's fascinating. Um, have you got any final things that you'd like people to do or check out online, or is is that everything covered? <laughs> I think I think we're done. Read the books. Okay. No, oh, no, that sounds, that makes it sound like people have to pay for something. Well. <laughs> I don't know. The Equality Trust website and the World <laughs> Economy website are free. Oh, the, the, right. books, <laughs> the books are the inner level and the spirit level, and we'll link to that in the. You'll send an email after with all the resources, and that'll be linked in. So, thank you very much, Kate and Richard, and uh, speak thank soon. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. My pleasure.